depending upon where you are. Uh, we'd like to get this uh, this webinar going uh, as quickly as possible. Um, we'd like to welcome Sean Elmer. Uh, Sean's a graduate of the University of Waterloo Engineering, and he's the lead technical product specialist for the company 2G Robotics. So uh, it says Sean that you have all kinds of experience that you're going to you're going to impart on us. So we're really anxiously looking forward to hearing everything you have to say. Obviously, all of us are, for the most part, looking at things from a forensic standpoint. But uh, regardless, we we definitely see where this uh, where this translates into. I mean, it's effectively the, a similar technology to uh, what we use all the time. So uh, one more thing that I wanted to uh, give a quick notice of, that we're going to have our third FSM conference in Orlando, Florida, and that's going to be November 14th through the 18th. Uh, you can expect to see a formal announcement coming out from Eugene at some point this week. He's actually at the SPAR conference uh, making sure that he represents uh, FSM there. So uh, with uh, no further ado, I would like to turn this over to Sean. Okay, uh, thanks David. Uh, so yeah, I guess uh, everyone here uh, doesn't have too much background in uh, underwater technology. Um, so I'll, I'll try to keep it light and, and a bit higher level uh, and try to avoid getting into uh, too technical of details. Um, basically, I'm going to run through uh, the, the technology that we have and how it works. Uh, the appropriate conditions to use it in, and then I have a bunch of uh, actual examples of projects that we've done, and a lot of them are tailored to the the offshore oil and gas market. But uh, you'll you'll find that uh, you can apply some of those same um, technical aspects to possibly some of the applications that you you guys have. So uh, I'll get started, and if anyone has any questions, please uh, feel free to ask uh, at any time. The presentation uh, always it's, uh, makes it a bit more interesting when uh, there's there's some ongoing dialogue. So uh, before we start, uh, a little bit uh, of background of our company, 2G Robotics. Uh, we were formed in 2007, based in uh, Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. Uh, so we're basically uh, a, a lot of the people who work here. Um, graduated out of the University of Waterloo along with the CEO or, or the founder. Um, and when we first started, we were experimenting with uh, various underwater and, and aerial robotics, um, but ended up focusing specifically on underwater laser scanning. We, we saw a sort of a need and, and a niche, and, and we went full on with um, developing this underwater technology. Uh, it, is somewhat new of a of a concept, relatively new within a couple of decades, um, and we're finding now that we're expanding into additional underwater imaging equipment to sort of complement our existing products. So you'll see uh, some of the developments we have in a little bit. So uh, I'd like to start off with uh, posing the question, why use lasers? Uh, and there's three main points that, that come up again and again, and, and, and these are them. So the first one is uh, using underwater laser scanning will precision, resolution, and point density. So if you get this here on the right, this is your traditional acoustic method from a uh, that's swim fly for this pipeline. And on the right, at the so for something like this where we're inspecting that pipeline, we've completely missed an area of interest here, an anomaly in the pipe using the acoustic. Method. Whereas with the, the laser method, we've got the full detail on that. We can sure the every aspect of it uh, and essentially determine that, hey, this is an this is anomaly that requires attention because it could produce uh, devastating results uh, that will result to financial loss. Uh, the second uh, second point is faster inspection speeds. So um, especially when, when you're capturing data from, from a moving vehicle, if you're sending out an, an acoustic signal, it's a, a sound signal, um, 
that's going to have a certain lag to it, so your vehicle can't move as fast. Uh, whereas the laser scanner is, is a light signal, instantaneous. Uh, you send the signal out, it returns almost immediately, uh, therefore allowing us to go to vehicle speed that we want. Um, and that especially comes into play with vehicles that are running on batteries. Uh, so the more the more length you can get or life you can get out of that battery means uh, more efficient your operations. And then finally, uh, all of um, all of the data that we collect is true scale. It, it is immediately true scale, so it it doesn't require any um, rigorous post processing or scaling to get to the final result. So you'll see some some examples of this um, moving forward. So uh, just a, uh, an overview of the products that we offer. I'll start with the, the three main laser scanners on the top row here. Uh, the first one being the ULS 100. So this is the first laser scanner that we developed. Um, it has a limited range, so its range is up to, to one meter or close to three feet. Uh, and it, it was meant to be used as a stationary laser scanner for close-up inspection. So, um, I mean, the height here is around 30 centimeters. So, it has the ability to get into pipes, get into tight, tight spaces, get into structures, and um, in an area of interest, let's say it's a ducted pipe or a, a leak somewhere, um, that's really the purpose of this. Uh, the ULS 200 is similar to the 100, only uh, we've extended the range a bit further. Um, so it's still, you know, getting close up and stationary um, and scanning a specific area of interest. So that, that laser scanner has a max range of 2.5 meters. We then uh, developed the, the ULS 500 because customers kept coming to us and saying, you know, the one meter was great, the 2.5 meter was great, but what we really need is, is meters. So we developed this system um, to be capable of scanning, laser scanning uh, up to 10 meters away. Uh, and, and we achieved that by incorporating a higher power laser, uh, air sensitivity sensor to identify the laser, increasing the offset between the laser and camera. And I'll explain how that works, uh, I believe, in the next slide. Um, the customers also said, it's great that you can laser scan from a stationary position, but what we really need is uh, the, the laser scanner to be capable of scanning from a stationary position, but also we want to be able to attach it to a vehicle and fly over seat, fly over structures, essentially painting those surfaces with the laser scanner and building up in real time a 3D model. So that's that's what the ULS 500 is. It's definitely uh, our most powerful, most robust unit. Um, so just to give you an idea, if I was to attach this to a large ROV, um, I would remove its actuator, it's just bolt it on, and attach the head to the vehicle and point it in the direction that I want, uh, and then scan while moving. These uh, the bottom row are are more new developments, um, starting with the ULS 500 Pro, which is uh, fully developed and, and available. The ULS 500 Pro is the next generation ULS 500. So um, what we've essentially done is made an, an even higher sensitivity sensor, which is allowing us to scan even further ranges. So it's essentially the same thing as the 500. Just one of these housings here, this housing here, has changed, giving us up to 15 to 20 meters of range. This, uh, this shot imager and C this combination of camera and LE, is that component that we're now adding to the laser scanner. Um, so we've developed this little system. We've also developed a system that. Um, is is it can work as a standalone underwater camera, but it, it is also highly meant to be integrated to the ULS 500. Uh, so we'll go over that uh, that technology in a little bit. Um, 
And then we have the, the C-Shot 3D, which is also a new development, and it's still sort of in beta testing. We have several of these units made, and we've just essentially shipped them out to corners of the world to specific customers and just have asked them to, hey, get out in the field, try this out, give us feedback uh, in order for us to further develop the product. So uh, I'll start by going over the technology of the light scanner uh, side of things. Uh, all our laser scanners operate on the same basic principles. So there is a sheet or swap that's emitted from the laser port. That has a 50 degree swap and static line onto this. So there's no beam that's rastering back to create this. The, the beaming, the prism head out into, into that line. Uh, and reflected back or some optical sensor, which is essentially a camera. Uh, and because we have a known mechanical and calibrated offset between this uh, laser port and, and the camera port, we can triangulate a certain points. So for the smaller units, we're triangulating 480 points, uh, and for the ULS 500, we're triangulating 1,400 points along the line. So uh, in the stationary mode, after it's captured one, one line of points, this head rotates about the actuator, and it's a very slight rotation. It's a micro step down to 0 0.0036 degrees, so you can barely even notice it moving. Uh, and an adjacent line of points is captured. So it'll continue rotating up to uh, 360 degrees, uh, essentially building this point cloud as it goes. It's, uh, if anyone's familiar with terrestrial LIDAR systems, we our technology works slightly differently. Um, so traditional terrestrial or in-air systems use a, a single beam and a, and a time of flight method. So they're, they're using that single beam, rastering it back and forth uh, and sideways, uh, up and down and sideways to build up the model, but they're calculating um, the time it takes for that light signal to bounce off the target and come back. And that's how they determine distances. We do not do any time of flight calculations. It's all triangulation of that laser plane. And, and the, the reason why we're doing this is because uh, when you're working underwater, uh, the different water conditions affect the time of flight of light. Uh, so let's say um, you're in salt water or fresh water, if you're in cold water or hot water, um, the pressure, so how deep you are, we don't want to have to account for those factors. So we chose the triangulation method and can go in any body of water and the same calibration will work for the laser scanner. This graphic shows dynamic operation. So instead of rotating now, we have this ULS 500 attached to a vehicle. It could be an automated underwater vehicle it could be a remotely operated vehicle in our OV, uh, or it could just be attached to a, a small survey boat. Um, same thing though, the laser emits um, its 50 degree swath, making a line on the surface. That line is, is seen by this camera and we're calculating 1400 points along the line. Uh, this, will, this whole system will then move and, and paint the surface with the laser as this camera is, is constantly capturing profiles at around 30 lines per second. So that's, that's 1,400 times 30, 40, 42,000 points per second. In terms of uh, telemetry or communications, uh, it's, it's a very simple layout for the stationary method. Uh, it's just one underwater cable that connects to the bottom of the actuator. Uh, all those signals are transmitted up through the actuator into the uh, control housing. Uh, and this is a, an important feature um, with our scanners is that this control housing is what is doing the calculation and analysis of the laser line, of these images capturing the laser line. 
So we're calculating 3D points, X, Y, Z points, uh, all within this sub-C bottle. That way when we transmit the data to the top side, it's very light packets of data. It's, I believe it's like six megabit per second transmission rates. Um, and we can show a real-time display of the point cloud in 3D as it's being captured. So that's kind of critical uh, feedback for the operator to determine, you know, is, is he operating the scanner properly? Does he have the right uh, parameter set or, or is he wasting his time? This is a, a view of the top side user's inner and it's really just to facilitate the scan operation. So to control the scanner, have this little display window, this 3D display window to get the feedback of what he's collecting. And then finally, uh, export or save the files as XYZ point files, which is uh, a format point. Uh, so you bring it in to other softwares. There's plenty of them out there uh, to do your more rigorous analyses. Um, this window is a 3D window, so you can zoom in, so rotate it around as if it was a, a CAD drawing. Now when we move to uh, mobile or dynamic uh, uses of the scanner, it does more complex. Uh, you can't really do this solely with the laser scanner, you now need additional third-party components um, because we, you have to account for the movement of the vehicle or the movement of the scanner itself to figure out how to translate each one of those lines of points. So what we'll have is uh, an inertial navigation system or an inertial measurement unit uh, close to the laser scanner. So this is measuring the acceleration in the XYZ. It's also measuring uh, yaw, pitch, and roll. We'll also have uh, GPS antennas. Uh, typically, they'll be at the top of the frame. Uh, all of these, all these components feed into uh, a third-party navigational software that um, can accept the the sensor data, uh, the positioning sensor data, can also take in the laser scanner data and adjust and transform all all of that information on the fly. The main, the key thing here is that there is some time source. So right now I have the time source um, generation from the pause computer system. This time source is a pulse per second signal followed by a lagging serial timestamp signal. Uh, so by taking this pulse per second signal all the way down to the laser scanner, this pulse per second also going to the GPS going to the inertial system, all of these systems are now time synchronized so we can um, we can transform our data based on the time synchronization with the positioning sensors. Even more complex is attaching the system to a remotely operated vehicle. Uh, it's more complex because we now need to fix the position of the U U um, sorry of the ROV. So we'll need additional sensors like uh, ultra-short baseline acoustic technologies. Here you see it pinging the location of the ROV. You may also have long baseline acoustic technologies, singly lots of uh, sonar transponders set up in an, on an array on the seabed to also get a, a nice fix on the position of the ROV. In addition, uh, on the ROV you'll have your inertial system. You may have a Doppler velocity log, which um, measures sort of uh, speed, uh, depth sensors, and then the laser scanner itself. Uh, with ROVs, ROVs are, are, have tethers, so it's like a fiber optic tether, so we can still control our, our scanner um, with our software, and we're still doing the, uh, uh, the real-time display on a, on a third-party software. So this is a this is a, a short video of uh, of the OS 500 on an ROV. So right now um, the ROV is in it's showing it in first person, but it's strafing from right to left, and we're moving the laser line across this surface and building up a, a point cloud of it.
It was interesting uh, for this demo, uh, the customer also decided, hey, let's, let's attach the laser scanner with the actuator still attached to the ROV. That way we can test both modes. So right now the ROV has set itself down on the seabed and we're committing to a stationary scan by rotating the laser scanner. This can also be done, this stationary mode. Uh, I, we have some examples where uh, the laser scanner is attached to a tripod and we're deploying it with divers. We could also have ROVs grab the laser scanner and tripod and place it in locations on, on the seabed or riverbed. So this is that uh, third-party navigational software, and there's a bunch of these out there, and, and we can uh, integrate our, our scanner with most of them. Um, but this this will give you an idea of the, of the real-time data coming in from our system. So you have this little uh, display box over here uh, with this little square graphic, which is the ROV. It's showing it encircling the the cage that we're scanning. And then this uh, window right in the middle of the screen is the raw data coming from our system into the third-party nav system. So the data is still raw. It hasn't been adjusted based on the positioning sensor. So you'll see this beam here is supposed to be straight and it's still curvy. We haven't done those transformations yet. But uh, within a really quick sequence of operations, um, oh, here's, here's another part of the structure, and it's kind of curvy because the ROV is moving up and down and all around, and um, that movement hasn't been accounted for yet. But once this operator parses it through his, his data processor, you'll see uh, all the data nicely aligned and transformed. So here he's transforming a, a segment of what he's captured. Now you'll see uh, the vehicle's movement in green, showing that it is kind of moving all around and all over the place. But uh, when we zoom in on the data, it'll be nice, crisp, uh, aligned data. This is a point cloud, so it's made up of hundreds of thousands of, of small points. Uh, another example here, uh, this is untethered uh, automated underwater vehicles. We have uh, our systems installed in, uh, in several of these that are operating worldwide to do things like pipeline scanning and, and seabed scanning. Uh, the setup is a little different in these. It requires a little bit more of a custom setup because there's limited space. Uh, this vehicle will be uh, three, meter, three meters long by around uh, a meter in diameter. Uh, and there's tons of sensors in there, so we have to limit our space. So what we do is we provide our housing separately. Uh, we mount them in the AUV and then do a calibration while on the AUV itself. So this video shows some of the components working together uh, in synchronization. This one is uh, the multi-beam monar array. This isn't provided by us, this is third party, but you'll see it's sending out that sound signal and the sound signal is bouncing back and it's building up a, 
a 3D cloud of, of what it sees. This will uh, have a wider coverage and a longer range, but it won't be uh, close to the resolution of the laser scanner. The laser scanner is um, Solutions of millimeters to sub-millimeters in sonar will be um, multi-centimeter data. This graphic's actually wrong. It's not a, a laser line moving back and forth. The, uh, I think the animators uh, messed that one up. also the, the camera and the LED flash. As the um, AUV is flying over the pipeline, it photo mosaicing these pictures as it goes. So this is these three components working together, all synchronized. The multi-beam does not affect the laser. Um, the camera flash and collecting is in between laser strobes uh, so that none of the components are interfering with each other. So I'll jump into uh, what we're looking for for water conditions um, and, and how those water conditions affect scan quality using the laser scanners. Uh, so first we have the, the water clarity or the water visibility. Uh, this is the most important factor. Uh, basically we're relying on a camera to see the laser line on the target. So uh, if you can't get a good picture or good video from a certain distance away in the environment, then the laser scanner won't hit good data. It'll just be all noise. So if you, for instance, can put a GoPro into the water and, and see a target from five meters away, then the laser scanner will be able to scan from five meters away. Ambient light uh, is another consideration. Uh, this is especially apparent near the surface uh, where you have ambient light hitting uh, ripples in the water. These uh, ripples are creating beams of light that are moving all around. That really tends to uh, confuse the laser scanner. Uh, so as you move deeper and deeper, the ambient light becomes more of a static situation, which is uh, produces less noise. And then the ideal case is just pitch darkness. Uh, typically, to get the best results, if you're near the surface, we'll recommend to, uh, to our customers to scan uh, during the night. Surface material, uh, this really only comes into play when there's something that's very shiny for water. Uh, so the ideal surface material is diffuse, which means non-shiny or non-specular. So if you think of a, a really shiny piece of stainless steel, it's, it's pretty much like a mirror, right? So if we're shining that laser line at that mirror, it's going to reflect back at the same angle as the angle that it approaches the mirror, and that's not necessarily going to be seen by the laser sensor or the laser camera. Luckily uh, for us, there's not too many things, uh, we don't run into too many scenarios where uh, there's shiny things underwater because uh, they don't stay shiny for that long. Stability. Uh, this, is, this is also a big factor. Uh, if you're pulling the uh, laser this tripod or in a position, any slight in that or that tripod will uh, translate to a large skew in the data set because we are measuring things uh, on the millimeter level. Uh, and then if it, uh, it's attached to a vehicle, we just need to make sure that that is rigid and there's no wiggling with that mounting. And in terms of scan distance, each laser scanner has a certain range that it uh, can operate in. Uh, and as you move the laser scanner further away, 
the the 50 degree laser swath becomes a, a larger line. So you're getting a larger coverage, but you're still dividing that line up into uh, the same points. So the point dispersion will be a little bit greater. So it's really a matter of how much resolution do you want versus how much area do you want to cover. So to describe some of our new development uh, technologies, I, I briefly showed the C-Shot 3D earlier. Uh, we made this product uh, in response to customers that had small sort of inspection class ROVs or um, archaeological type diver associations that wanted to scan large areas um, but could not afford the large ULS 500 all of the, the hefty and expensive positioning that's required to do that scanning while moving. So uh, help this stereo dual stereo uh, cam system, so it's two cameras, uh, and the width of this is about shoulder width. And basically by shining um, the two cameras on an object, there's going to be an overlapping region between these two cameras. We can identify pixels that are uh, similar to both cameras and using the same sort of calibration where we know the offset between these two cameras, we can pinpoint those pixels, those common pixels in 3D space relative to um, the C-Shot 3D. So what it's going to do is it's going to collect uh, around a 40 second video. Uh, that video is then going to incorporate some SLAM algorithms to build up a 3D model scene. And its range is only half a meter to half meters at the moment, but it's still sort of a beta test product that uh, once proven the technology, I'm sure, will add more sort of cameras, increase baselines, and make it more suitable for more rigorous applications. Very simple, just uh, one underwater cable connected to the sea shot. So this can be diver held. You can swim around, collect video. That, that video creates a, a true scale 3D point cloud. Or it can be tied into a small ROV. So this is the sort of process. It's, uh, you collect the video. This video right now, it has to be sent to our facility. Uh, we can then send back uh, a process point within, uh, within a couple of days. All the results are true scale. Uh, and, and right now, we only have it so that it's a 40 second video capture. So this video shows, uh, this is a view from one of the cameras. So all of these little points that are, uh, that are being shown are points that we recognize as common with the other camera. So this is just in a, a test pool uh, with some cinder blocks set up. Uh, so we're going to collect a 40 second video, slowly moving this system around the, the target object. Uh, and using sort of SLAM type algorithms to, to build up the model. So we're actually tracking the movement of the system itself based on capturing images and then the next set of images and seeing how uh, the system has moved. So we do not need any positioning sensors for this product. So you will see the uh, final point cloud results in a second here. So this won't be as high of a resolution as a laser scanner, but it's still going to be uh, much better than what you'll achieve in terms of precision uh, versus uh, sonar. We 
also have and this is a, one of our other reasons. So this picture just shows the ULS 500 standard system with the imager and the LED on top of it. And basically, um, the ULS 500 is going to capture laser lines. And in between those laser lines, the cameras and, and the LED is going to flash and, and take an image. All that data, those images are going to be photomosaic and, and, and contoured to the micro-bithymetry of the laser data. So it's a really high-powered, um, high quantum efficiency scientific uh, camera. Uh, and that's what you really want is, underwater for cameras is uh, a really high sensitivity. So you're limiting your exposure time. So it's, it's going to provide a 5.5 megapixel, and that's a true 16-bit uh, depth 5.5 megapixel result. Uh, so for instance, at 10 meters of range, one single pixel will cover a four millimeter box. To, uh, to compare the various technologies, these first four are our systems. So the ULS 500, 200, ULS 100, uh, the C-Shot 3D. Uh, which is the stereo camera system. And then I've just thrown in a generic multi-beam acoustic system, which is most similar to the ULS 500, but only acoustic, and, uh, and photogrammetry. So in terms of output, all these technologies produce a 3D point cloud. In terms of range, uh, the laser scanners have limited ranges with our largest scanner having a range of up to 15 meters now uh, versus the stereo camera system uh, right now it's only two and a half meters uh, and this is really where acoustics has the advantage is in its range capabilities because the, the sound signal is not doesn't dissipate as much as the laser signal does um, and then photogrammetry it's a camera system depends on how you set it up so I've just thrown in uh, one meter to ten meters do these technologies provide true scale results? The laser scanners, since we know the offset between the laser and the camera, yes, everything that we provide, the models you can measure on them, are in true scale. Same with the C-Shot 3D, and same with, uh, with multi-beam acoustic. Photogrammetry, traditionally, no. So uh, you take a bunch of pictures from several different angles, uh, and then Similar to the C-Shot 3D, you, you recognize commonality points and build up a model, um, but it's not going to be true scale. You will need some sort of scale reference on the target, and then in post-processing, scale everything, which uh, can have its, its downfalls and its, its errors. What, what type of coverage do these technologies offer? The laser scanner is a, a more focused beam, so it's only 50 degree swath. Uh, the C-Shot 3D uh, up to 2.5 meters squared. Uh, again, mo the multi-beam acoustic, it's going to get a wider coverage. It's going to have that longer range, but it's not going to be uh, close to the precision and resolution of laser scanning. And photogrammetry just depends on uh, the field of view. So in terms of resolution, uh, all of our scanners have a millimeter to sub-millimeter level resolution. Uh, the C-Shot 3D will be centimeters to multi-millimeters, and then the acoustic is multi-centimeters. As a technology, a turbidity dependent, water clarity dependent, uh, all of the optical systems, so the laser scanners, C-Shot 3D, and photogrammetry, yes, they are all subject to water turbidity. If you can't see a certain distance away with the system, with the camera on the system, then you cannot use the system. Multibeam does not have that limitation. Uh, can we integrate onto vehicles? Uh, so as I mentioned before, the, the ULS 500 is the only laser scanner that can uh, readily integrate onto vehicles for time synchronization with positioning systems. Uh, the C-Shot 3D, yes, uh, and also same with the multibeam photogrammetry. Can you see a real-time point cloud as the data is being captured? So the answer is yes for uh, our laser scanner systems, 
but with the CSHOT 3D stereo camera system, there's still quite a bit of processing that needs to go on uh, that's applied to that 40 seconds of dual video. And multi-beam, yes, uh, but regular photogrammetry, no. You're, you're taking individual images and you need to run that through some, some software um, to get your result and then also scale that result. Okay, so I'm going to move into uh, offshore oil and gas examples. So it might be a little different from what you're used to, but you may be able to see how some of this could apply to, to some of the projects that you work with. Sean, before we go any further, I had a question. Yeah. Um, uh, and it was, how do you manage refraction? Water refraction. Yes. Yeah, so that is all calibrated and built into the scanner itself. So all of our systems we calibrate in our facility. We have pools of water. We'll put them in the water. Um, sort of a, a secret on how we do it. Mm -hmm. okay. But basically we're accounting for that refract. Okay. Um, and just to, so everyone knows, I'm Sarah Davis. I'm um, just the kind of fielding the question, and we haven't had any questions, so I'm concerned that maybe we all don't know where that part is in the screen. Um, to the right of your screen when you're looking at it, there should be a couple different plus signs you can click on, dashboard attendees, polls, chat, um, and when you go into chat, if you use the drop-down menu to select send questions to staff, that's where you can send questions to me, and I will stop Sean as you requested, and uh, ask him whatever question. And I'm going to mute myself now because I have no other questions. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, this this last part here will get a bit more interesting. It'll show you uh, actual uses where we've, where we or our customers have used our systems and show you the results. So, uh, first one being these Hugen uh, AUV integrations. So these large underwater vehicles that are unmanned, untethered, that are sent into the ocean and can go down to 3,000, 4,000 meters of depth, uh, fly over seabed and, and scan pipeline. And they're mainly using this with their offshore clients uh, to scan hundreds of kilometers of pipeline just uh, doing sort of asset uh, integrity assessments. They're also mainly looking for free span detection. And so free span is where you have a pipeline that is unsupported by seabed. There's a seabed has been dug up underneath the pipe, and that can be uh, a real trouble spot for pipelines and um, can result in fatal uh, fractures of the pipeline. So to date, uh, at the end of 2015, using our laser scanner on these vehicles, there's been around 2,500 kilometers of pipeline scanned. And that's for all various customers, your shell and your BPs and, and all of them. So here's a, pictures of some sample results of the AEVs flying over this pipeline at around 7 to 10 meters, which produces around a 7 to 10 meter coverage. In this example, uh, it's showing this pipeline moving over concrete mattresses, which are protecting underlying pipes. Here's another example uh, where you have this layover sleeper. So there's this sleeper bringing this pipeline up over another object, also concentrating its, uh, its movements along this sleeper. Uh, buoyancy collars, so a pipeline that has a, a flotation collar on it to centralize this movement in this area. So you can really see how it's digging itself into uh, the seabed. And then this is the, the, the buoyancy collars uh, with the stills imaging. You can see it contoured to the bathymetry of the laser data. So it just provides uh, more information, more detail in between the, the points of the laser. There's a, this other company, Aetis Deep Ocean. They are from the UK, uh, Scotland, uh, and they started using our systems in 2012, 2013. Um, and what, we'll, what they've done is they'll attach uh, the full system to the ROV uh, and fly the ROV around dynamically, but also 
place the ROV down and rotate the scanner from a stationary position to do uh, structure inspections. So here's a, a video of one of the sample results. So this is all laser data uh, with the ROV flying around dynamically. So the ROV would fl flown over this pass. You'll see another pass right here and then another one here. You can really see uh, some of the details in, in the fish on the bottom. And then uh, I, I believe they've um, overlaid this point cloud on the CAD template of the as-built of, of this uh, structure just to show how true scale that the data really is. Now the laser scanner cannot go through objects. So for the inside of the structure, it may be difficult to get some of the details because it's being shadowed by the outer structure. This data was captured in around 20 minutes of moving the ROV around. Here's another uh, pipeline termination structure. So the RV will have flown over this pipeline and then in and around this structure. The, the faster you move the vehicle, the more space you'll have between lines of points. So we generally like the vehicles to move uh, move around less than a knot in speed. So there's some com concrete mattresses protecting the pipeline. Okay, um, here's a, another example, uh, a spoometrology example. So what we have here is uh, five flange or five, yeah, five capped flanges on the seabed, as shown from this top-down diagram. Um, these flanges need to be, we need to realize the orientation and position of these flange faces relative to another tie-in point 30 meters away. And we know where the other flange tie-in points are because it's a newly installed uh, structure. So what we need to do is just simply reference these five flanges. Uh, so I can, I can bring up my actual point cloud viewer here. So we did these six stationary scans from tripod positions. And this is 90 meters deep in the ocean. Uh, each scan performing at 360, and then using common points between the scans to, to merge them together. Uh, so you can really see the, the sort of uh, detail that we're getting here. Uh, one thing that may be of interest is this tan sticking out of the seabed. Uh, our operators got a little freaked out when they saw that, but I, I think they determined that it was just a work glove. Uh, see some sort of merchant or marine life there. 
these concrete mats were previously covering the pipelines and, and the ROV dragged them off. So you'll see these three transponders in the scene. These are uh, long baseline acoustic transponders. And so we know uh, the position of these transponders in real world, um, real world geo coordinates. So by knowing the uh, reference points on these three transponders, we now know where this scene, this entire scene is uh, in geo coordinates. Okay, here's a, another example where we use one of our smaller scanners inside of uh, a pipe or it's called an eye tube. It's hanging off the side of this floating production vessel. Uh, this eye tube is 44 inches in diameter. And this customer basically wants to build up a full model of the entire 30-meter uh, line of this tube with 15 meters of it being in air and 15 meters of it being in water. So. What I came up with was uh, this spring actual actuator uh, with the OS 200 mounted at the bottom. And as we're lowering this frame on into the tube, we're doing 360 degree scans at set intervals all along uh, the length. So this is the end result. You'll see these holes drilled into the tube. Uh, I believe that was help cool the high power umbilical that they intended to pull through to. So now we're getting into the water section. You'll see a bit more marine growth on the sides. So each individual scan would have been about a, a meter of length of the tube, and all of them were stitched together and to build up the full model. These some be a little bit more interesting uh, for you guys. These are uh, shipwreck and salvage examples. So this is uh, one of the first projects I had where we're using the U100 dynamically uh, from a small survey boat, and this large liner in Italy, the costing toppled over on. And once they write it up, uh, what they really needed to do was build up a, a full model of this entire damaged side of the ship uh, to understand uh, what's the geometry of this damage and can we uh, identify where there's mount or the tanks to the ship get it out of the out of so attacking the ULS 500 to a survey boat and doing multiple passes, sweeping that lake line across the underwater hull, uh, we were then able to buy a full 3D. This was coupled with uh, above water LIDAR. So this top here is a LIDAR scan. It's been merged with the under laser. Uh, one question. Um, there, there's so you can use the underwater one of water. It's not yes, yes, you can. It was not you can? Used in this. Case. Okay. okay, thanks. Uh, some clothing details of of the ship. Uh, you can actually go the the ladder of the ship itself, uh, and that's because. Different colors return back different intensities, so you'll get a lower intensity point from darker color and a higher intensity point from a lighter color. And then I, I snipped this little segment because I think there's some really cool detail here. Uh, we actually picked up much of this netting. 
which really shows the type of precision you get with uh, underwater lister scanning. You can see that the survey boat was moving up and down as it was scanning. Um, because we're compensating, all of that pieces have been nicely aligned. Here's another example at the Mono Hand Session in, in Lake uh, We direct for a company called Noah. They just wanted to paint a digital wreck of this shipwreck. Previous to this was more images and then a model up from 20 student divers going up and doing tape measures, uh, which we found a lot of the were really off. Even some of the big ones, like the diameter of, of this instrument that they previously had, a couple of feet off. Uh, this is around three meters tall, just to give you an idea on scale. So all those stationary scans, about 13 scans, we did two over sections and built up this model. And this is a point cloud, so if you were to zoom in, you'd see individual points. Some really nice detail here in this. Some of the, the I've swum, uh, swam on this shipwreck dozens of times said that, that they'd never seen some of this detail before uh, with, with their eyes. the boiler that off the ship when it crashed. Again, really nice detail, especially you, when you look at uh, the rivet up close, measure the size of those rivets. Also through this oh, more recent trial, and it was in the Monterey Canyon of California. It was just a, a trial with a, a called uh, M and wanted to test the U.S. from a, a moving ROV. Just going to zoom in on this uh, on our canyon. So again, the ROV, your full positioning sensor along with the laser scanner. It's moving very slowly, so there's small gaps between adjacent lines, so the lines are being, there, there's a uh, there. So the next is uh, adding the stills, and adding even more image and information to drape over. This video might might seem all the might seem a little choppy on your um, it is smooth on my end. I think the the connection speeds.
Okay, so uh, the last, last two slides is just a couple of highlights um, more pertaining to dynamic operation and what sets our product apart. Some of the other products out there, main thing being collaboration process requires uh, no calibrations while offshore. So a lot of our customers, or sorry, a lot of our competitors have products that are, are similar, but uh, get offshore, they put their product in the wall and need to do all sorts of compensation and testing to get that calibration sorted out for that specific body of water. Um, we do it in-house, ship the equipment out, and uh, you, you put it in the water and start scanning. Our, our time synchronization is something that we're very proud of and have worked really hard to achieve is uh, having the most accurate time synchronization produces uh, the highest possible accuracy for data collection um, via the GPS signal and, and really high sample rates so you're capturing 30 frames per second helps eliminate in the data and, and avoid missing critical information. We've been um, deploying these systems for a number of years in track record uh, various customers globally essentially that own these systems and them, as well as us and, uh, services. In terms of uh, the laser and still camera, I, I believe it's one of these powerful components out there, um, specifically because we've developed this laser scanner separately from the stills camera. Uh, so there's some other products that will use the same camera to identify the laser line, uh, to also take both images. And what you really want is a camera that's uh, specialized and been specifically selected to identify the laser line, which will have different parameters from the camera that's been specifically selected to capture uh, high resolution stills images with their sensitivity to it. Uh, image assist, that's something that we're working on that next generation positioning, up, updating based on image feedback. So I won't get into the complexities of that. Um, but low, low power consumption really comes into play on, on the vehicles that have uh, battery life. And then our team of, of engineers that are, have all been training can go offshore, go on rigs, boats, uh, and really provide that uh, next level service. So uh, yeah, that's that's it for the presentation. Looks like I did pretty well on timing. Uh, so if we, is there any more uh, questions? Well, I think I wanted to thank you very much for this excellent, excellent presentation. I I never knew the the depth of uh, of everything that you could do with the technology. I mean, I guess I figured you could, but I thought this was amazing myself, so I think you did an excellent job communicating it in a in a manner that all of us could understand easily. But uh, uh, thank you. I think hey, you did. Yeah, it. no problem. No problem. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, hopefully everyone has uh, my contact information, or Sarah or David provided in case anyone has any follow-up questions. Uh, um, feel free to contact me and. I should be able to get back to you. Excellent. I have, I have uh, two questions um, about the laser color and why it was blue. And That's then a also, really good question. Yeah. And then also, um, if you're using flash, how do you um, kind of like, I, I'm a traditional photographer, so we're always taught like when you're underwater and you take a picture with a flash, there's kind of like these little like ghost little beams that are everything that is in the water that's reflecting off of that flash. So how do you um, take that into effect? Is that just part of the magic of the um, post-processing, or is that something uh, that was thought of? <laughs> yeah, no. Um, so why we selected blue. Uh, yeah. Blue is closest to the actual color of water. OK. Um, so it will penetrate the furthest. Uh, okay. That especially comes into play when you're in deep 
ocean water. When you're closer to the surface, green laser will be a little bit better because there's more green marine growth in some locations, but for the most part, uh, blue is ideal. Um, in terms of the cameras, uh, the only thing we can really do is have an extreme uh, sensitivity and an extreme uh, amount of resolution to, to really help mitigate the effect of particles lighting up in the water column. Um, yeah, because I'm assuming that it's kind of a fixed focus camera, right? Like it's just, or is it auto-focusing in some way? <clears throat> it, it is, um, it, it's triggering the exposure of the camera at a okay. really hot, uh, because it's so sensitive, we don't have to uh -huh. expose it for a very long time. Okay, okay. So the moment you expose it for a long time, especially if you're on a moving vehicle, you're just going to start to get blurriness. So we've done tests where um, we've been moving at knots and we're not getting any blurriness in the camera because it's... it's a... Okay, got it. That's all. Okay. Okay, are there any other questions? All right, uh, Sean, I wanted to thank you again for uh, everything that you did, uh, for the presentation, everything you showed us. It was, it was really interesting to our conference in, in Orlando and come November. So uh, I guess without uh, further ado, I guess we're going to end the, end the uh, webinar.